Good morning, everybody. How are we today? Welcome to day two of Genetic Genealogy Ireland. We had a fabulous day yesterday, and we're going to have a fabulous day today. We've had the biggest crowds ever. It's so nice to see so many people coming from overseas to join the conference. There's lots of chatting going on. There's lots of uh, social intercourse, drinks, food. It's all very good. And today we have a uh, wonderful array of speakers and array of topics, and we also have a panel discussion halfway through the day, so there's plenty uh, to keep you occupied for the duration of this rather damp Saturday. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers, uh, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. We also have Family Tree DNA, who are our sponsors outside at this stand, so if you do want to do any DNA testing, uh, do go and ask the volunteers on the stand which DNA test is best for you. But to kick off this morning, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Donna Rutherford. Now, Donna uh, works in the technology industry as a global business operations manager and is currently working mostly in cloud technology space. Uh, she is professionally an accountant, but worked mostly in IT management during her career. And uh, Donna runs the DNA Facebook group, uh, DNA Help for Genealogy? Yep. yep. And uh, for UK. And today Donna is going to take us through autosomal DNA testing for beginners. So please give a warm welcome to Donna Rutherford. Very funny accent. I'm actually a New Zealander. I, I live in London. I've lived in London for a number of years, but I, I originally come from New Zealand, so that's where my accent comes from. Um, so, first thing, question to you guys How many of you have already done a DNA test? Wow. You know, people were saying yesterday we asked this question two or three years ago, and only a very small number of the audience would put up their hand. It's really interesting this year, just about all of the audience puts up their hand. Hopefully after my presentation, I hope that you might think about getting some value out of that investment you've made in your DNA test. So looking at ways of extending your genealogy research using that test that you've done. For those of you who haven't done a test, I hope you go and buy yourself a test before you leave the show today. Good show prices and I think you'll really get the benefit for your, for your genealogy. Um, but a couple of things before you do that, there is a, so a couple of warnings. You may find surprises in your DNA results. A lot of people do. Some of those surprises are good surprises, interesting surprises. There can also be some bad surprises. Uh, some people find that their father isn't their father, for example. They might find they've got cousins they expect them to match that they don't. Um, if, if you don't want to find that out about your family, then we suggest that you don't test. Um, the other thing is uh, DNA testing is highly addictive. Uh, we've, we've been talking this weekend about uh, setting up DNA Anonymous. Uh, most of us go on and test many of our families, our friends. Some of my friends, as soon as they come and visit me, they knock on my door, I ask them to spit in a tube or I scrape their, scrape their cheek. I've run out of family, so that's why I'm starting on all my friends now. Um, one disclaimer, I am not a scientist, as Morris mentioned, I am a, a professionally an accountant, I work in IT, um, I'm not a scientist and I'm not going to talk to you about science. But also in saying that, I'm going to start off with a slightly scientific slide, and that's because I think it's really useful for you to know a little bit about the science behind DNA. You don't need to know a lot about genetics to, to use your DNA test and work your DNA test. So don't be put off if you're not a genetics student. Um, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. All of us have them in our cells. We get uh, one of the pairs from our biological mother and the other one from our biological father. 22 of those are called, auto are called the autosomes. And that's why it's called an autosomal DNA test, because we're looking at the DNA on chromosome 1 to 22. We do have two other special chromosomes that some people call the sex chromosomes. If you're a female, you have two X, um, two X chromosomes. If you're a, a male, you have an X and a Y chromosome. The father decides the sex of the baby. If only someone had told him you're in the eighth, right? And might not have beheaded some of his wives. 
Um, but the, uh, depending upon what chromosome you get here, it comes from your biological father. If you have a Y chromosome, you're male. So the types of DNA tests, well the first one is the autosomal DNA test and pretty much after this slide that's all I'm going to talk about. Um, so this test is most useful for genealogy. It will, it will test um, and your results will be from the last five or six generations of your family, so very much the genealogical time frame. Um, the other two tests that are offered are the Y DNA test, so that's for men only because only men have Y chromosomes, right? Um, this type of DNA test is we, we sometimes call it deep ancestry. So it will track through your father's 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 line and look at the DNA that you've um, you've inherited from this entire um, paternal line. It is deep ancestry because it could go back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Not not necessarily now something to use for your genealogy to start with, um, and now the autosomal DNA test is kind of fitting that, fitting that spot. Um, most commonly we test that at FTDNA, there's two types of tests, STR markers and SNP packs. Mitochondrial DNA comes down through the mother's 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 line, so it's kind of a maternal test also, we call it deep ancestry because it can go back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but bear in mind, mitochondrial DNA isn't just with women. Um, although mothers pass it on to their children, they pass it on to both their boy children and their girl children. So everybody has mitochondrial DNA. It's not on the chromosome, it's in the nucleus of the cell. It's quite a different type of DNA. Um, but we can use that to look at the maternal line. So how does an ultrasonal DNA test, I'm still a little bit sciencey here, so I apologise, we're going to get to something a bit more interesting soon, but um, the, the DNA is basically your genetic code, and if you start thinking about it as code, it's the coding that makes you you, it's your unique genetic code. And if you, your genetic code is like somebody else's genetic code, then you have a common ancestor, you're, you're closely related. So what the test does, you, you come here, you, you send off your saliva sample, you're squishing in a tube or scraping your cheek, you send it off to the lab and they ana analyse parts of your DNA. Now, we don't do a whole genome sequence with this test, we're only looking at very specific parts of your DNA that are useful for genealogy. Someone described it to me once, it's, we look, if you think of a skyscraper, we're looking at the DNA that might be in, a, in an office space, just one office in a skyscraper. That's all we're looking for at this test, but um, we know the areas of the DNA that are useful for genealogy. So at each of the locations they test, you'll have this code, and the code is one of four letters, A, T, C, or G. It's the name of a chemical, these are, these are chemicals. I'm not going to try and pronounce them, I said to you, I'm not a science, I will pronounce them wrong for sure in my accent. Um, but it's useful to know that we're looking at these A, T, C's and G's, and depending upon where they are on your chromosome and whether your string of letters matches somebody else's string of letters. If you've ever opened up your raw DNA, you will tell you never to do it because you won't understand it's gobbled and good. It actually isn't. It will tell you it's been tested. It will tell you the chromosome number, the position of the chromosome, and what your code is. You have two columns of code because you have two of every chromosome. But here's something interesting that, that you need to know because we sometimes get a bit confused. We're trying to work out which of our chromosomes come from our mother, which comes from our father, and how to split our matches up into maternal and paternal. The test cannot tell you that. So if I look down column one, this isn't all the DNA code I have from my father. This one could be my father, this one could be from my mother, this one could be from my mother, this one could be from my father. The test can't tell you which side um, your matches come from. And that's why we go on often and test other people in our family to help us work it out. So if you have long segments of code in common with someone, then they are closely related to you. The more of the code you have in common, the more, the closer that relationship is. There are some rules. We don't look at very tiny segments because we all have the same tiny segments. That telling us about the storm outside. It's not as much warmer in here. Um, 
So there are some rules around that. We don't look at very tiny bits of code that are uncommon. Um, and, we, um, and we look at the amount of shared DNA. And I will mention it later, but the, the way we uh, measure DNA is in a very complicated calculation that creates a number of centimorgans. You'll see it sometimes written as CM. And centimorgans is the measurement we use to work out how much code we have in common with someone. So now I want to introduce you to my grandparents. So from the left is Jack, Jack Rutherford, Dorothy Croker, Stanley Hancock, and Annie Florence String. Jack is my Rutherford uh, paternal line. He's uh, Scottish-Irish. Uh, Dorothy is a, a, is a Cockney. She was born in London uh, in the East End. He's only lived in the East End for a long time. My grandfather Stanley, who unfortunately died a long time before I was born and never met him, um, he's, he's a bit of everything in the UK. He's from all over the place. And my lovely nana, um, Annie, uh, she's a dring, and most of her family were from Yorkshire. Now, I want to show you how DNA is inherited because this is important when you're trying to look at your matches to understand perhaps why you match someone closer than you think or, or why maybe your sister's got different matches than, than you have. Um, this is my dad who's, who's also sadly passed away a few years ago now. He, everybody inherits 50% of their parents' DNA, so you get half of your parents' DNA, but it's randomised. So they've got two number one chromosomes, they are ran joined together, they're randomised, and that the child will get a random 50% of the chromosome, one that they had from their parent. So if you have a look here, my dad got half of, half of um, my grandmother's DNA, half my grandfather's DNA, and mum got the same. Now, I've not asked my mother if I can use her photo, so if any of you in New Zealand happen to meet my mother, don't tell her that you've already seen her photo. Um, and this is mum and dad on their wedding day. Now, um, uh, Annie and Stan also gave half their DNA to my mother. Now, this is my sister. I've also not asked my sister if I can use her baby photo. Um, this is me when I was a baby. Now, we've both inherited 50% of mum and dad's DNA. But you can see here that when our dad's mixed up his DNA he's got, she's given me half of it, I've ended up with a small bit of Dorothy and quite a large bit of Jack. My sister, on the other hand, has more of Dorothy's DNA and a smaller amount of Jack, and the same thing on my mum's side. So once my sister and I are full siblings and we, we share the right amount of DNA, we have quite different DNA because of the way we were inherited from our, from our parents. So it's not right to say that we get 25% of our DNA from our grandparents. We, we get this random mixed up amount. So, moving on to what you get when you test. The first thing everyone gets excited about is their ethnicity. Where did they come from? And this is my, uh, my ethnicity result from uh, family tree DNA. And I'm mostly uh, British Isles and, and, and West Europe. Um, a lot of people say to me, well, we've tested at other sites and we've uploaded our DNA somewhere else. And I, I look different. I, I seem to have a different ethnicity. Which site is correct? Which of these ethnicities am I really? And I always say to them, just pick the one you like. Um, unfortunately, the, the science isn't quite accurate <coughs> enough for us to really deep dive into our ethnicity. Um, it, it will get better in time, but at the moment we do see different results in different sites. And this person who seems to be lots of different things is all me. This is all my tests, all the different places I've uploaded my DNA. Um, my ancestry test, you can see I'm mostly Great British and Irish, and that's mostly what I, what I expect with my paper trail. Fits very nicely with my paper trail. Um, you can see over here, um, I also have about 2% finish here. But when I put my DNA on, uh, on uh, DNA land, I'm something like about 10% Finnish with them. Uh, down here, I seem to be French and Spanish. Over here, I seem to have 10% of my DNA coming from Tuscany. And, and here, I'm a, I'm a bit more sort of British, Irish, West Europe again. So you can see that, you, you know, it's a, it might not help you with your genealogy. And, and really, you've done your paperwork, no, well, most of you have probably done your paperwork, and, and this should really confirm where you think you come from, but please 
a great and it's, and it's really interesting to look at. But we want to move on to the real power of DNA, and that's the, the cousin matches we're getting. And that's where we can make real value of these tests that we've, you know, our DNA that we've given up, um, that we've invested in. So we get a couple of things from the, from the cousin matches. First of all, we get a, a long list of cousins. Most of us will have hundreds, if not thousands, of cousins come up in our match list. Things to have the closest always going to be near the top. So if you've tested a parent or a child or siblings and then um, aunts, uncles, they're going to show near the top of your list and then it will work your way down to maybe smaller uh, matches, fifth, sixth cousin at the bottom of your list. Now, just to show you how many people are now testing, when I did my very first test with Ancestry UK back in very early 2015, I had 32 fourth cousins and closer. As of this morning, because I look every day, <laughs> I'm still at the same as I had last week, I've got 154 fourth cousins and closer. So you can see that, you know, you can so many more matches, and your match list will just grow all the time. And this is this is the beauty of the DNA test as an investment because it's continuously changing for you. you. You're getting new matches every day. You never know when you're going to get one match that might solve that little puzzle you've got in your tree. We'll also give you a measurement. Uh, we mentioned it before. It's measured in centimorgans. So you quite often see when you get your results it will have a, a prediction of where the match is. It might, it might be predicted a, a half, a, a, an uncle or aunt or a first or second cousin, those are really just buckets, category names that you, you'll put in based on the amount of um, CM, the amount of DNA you share. So here's an example, here's my first, second, possibly a first or second cousin, I need to go away and figure that out, and 421 centimorgan. So you'll often see that written alongside a number of segments as well, so you might see share 420 centimorgans over five segments and that just means five different places on your chromosomes that you match someone. So it might be a big block on chromosome one and there's some little blocks on other chromosomes. So how does this help you with genealogy? Well if you think this is me here, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s um, and if I do a DNA test I'm looking at five to six generations that this is useful for, for my genealogy. And if you look at this grey box here, this is the sort of map of my tree that I might be able to solve some puzzles for using DNA or confirm that I've got the right people in the right boxes. I've got a couple of interesting things on mum's side. Her grandparents were first cousins. Perhaps what, that's what they do in Yorkshire. But uh, these guys married. So I actually have four less grandparents up here. Most people have 64, four, four times great grandparents. I actually only have 60 because these two people are the same people. Um, but I have a couple of mysteries here. My great-grandmother was illegitimate. All her birth certificates say is illegitimate. She went to the grave saying she never knew who her father was. Well, I've actually solved that puzzle now. Um, she couldn't solve it. I wish I could have solved it before she died. Um, but uh, we have now found out that actually her stepfather was her real father. And this came to light when I suddenly was getting a whole lot of matches to her stepfather's family. And I well, how can I match them with DNA? He was only her stepfather. And as we put the pieces of the puzzle together, we've realised her stepfather was indeed her real father. And, and how sad that she, she never knew. Uh, but some other problems up here. Um, this man's a real mystery. Thomas Robertson from Scotland. Um, We've never known which Thomas Robertson he was. Robertson, one of the most popular names in the area he said he was from in Scotland. I'm now actually pretty much solved this puzzle as well because I suddenly had a whole lot of Robertson families matching me. And I'm like, there's no Thomas Robertson, there's no Thomas Robertson. Started to dig into the paperwork, found some very old census documents where there indeed was an older son called Thomas Robertson. And I'm now finding a lot of other um, matches who have also got the same family in their tree. What I'm trying to do now is disprove that Thomas Robertson isn't the match on that tree. I'm looking through all the other branches and say, perhaps I'm, you know, it's just coincidence, so it's, they've got a Thomas Robertson. 
So I'm trying to disprove my theory as a way of proving it. So we're now, I'm now working on all those matches, and I think after all this time, I've finally got who my Thomas Robertson is. I now have to convince the hundreds of people who have copied the wrong person into their family tree, but that's a job for another day. However, what I can do here, I talked about going back five or six generations. If I test my parents, that will take me back another step again. So you can see the pink outline of uh, my mother's test. And so that will get me to matches that come from another generation back. And that will help me keep going back further. Now, I mentioned before my dad had sadly passed away. He had five brothers. I've tested four of them. They all live out in New Zealand, but I've managed to get kits to them. And I've tested four of his brothers. So I've been able to get back further on my dad's line as well because I had those four kits sitting there instead of my dad. And I'm very thankful that they've been interested enough to, to be involved and to, to give me their, uh, their saliva. So, so that's, how, that's how you can start using DNA to solve these little family mysteries. And this is my Scottish-Irish line, complete mystery. Um, this is a lady called Sarah Goldie. We have no <coughs> clue who her parents are. I can't find her anywhere. Um, she just has Ireland as her place of birth on, on the census. And I'm looking to try and find, I haven't done a lot of work up on her line, but I'm looking to try and find some matches that might help me work out who she actually is. And then on my father's paternal line, I have done Y testing on my, y, on, on my uncle's Y DNA. And um, I do know my Rutherfords were originally from Scotland. Um, my paper trail goes cold in Northern Ireland in, in around the seven, late 1700s. I may never be able to bridge that gap, but I am at least now trying to figure out why my, why my family were in Ireland, but even though I knew they were Scottish. Um, and and, and that's, that's a really interesting um, piece of work I'm doing now. Oh, we presume, of course, they came over in the Ulster Plantation, even though that makes sense. And finally, they, they moved back to Scotland. Went out to New Zealand. That wasn't me. <laughs> Is that you, Morris? <laughs> so, as I said before, you know, we've got this genetic code that we compare, and the more genetic code we have in common, which is counted in centimorgans, means how close is that match to you. Now, on the ISOG wiki, you'll find this chart, and this is a, a handy-dandy chart to give you an idea of what the relationship might be. So up here, if you're sharing around 3,500 centimorgans with someone, it's a parent-child relationship. Sharing around 2,500 centimorgans, it's a full sibling. And we go down the list. I, I had to work out what double first cousins were. It wasn't a relationship I'd ever heard of before, but it's basically a pair of brothers marrying a pair of sisters, and, and you may quite find that in, in trees where you know you come from small areas, and, and that, that's what happened. And very similar with my first cousins. And, and just to just to explain, my first, any, anyone on my first cousin branch, their matching to me looks a little bit closer because I have additional DNA because of that pedigree collapse and that intermarriage. And I've worked out it's about one generation closer. So anyone on that line that I match to, I usually know it's one generation back rather than the category we get put in because, of course, I've got more DNA in common. Um, so we work down through the list. And as we go down, you'll see that the, the number of relationships that it might be gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So, it, you know, the, the centimorgans can't tell you exactly what the relationship is. It can just point you to kind of a bucket that it could be one of these relationships. Like a guy called Blaine Bettinger, you may have heard of, he's quite a well-known genetic genealogist in the States. He sourced a whole lot of information from all of us, all of us genetic genealogists that have confirmed matches. And we've been able to, he's been able to create a chart with confirmed relationships and the amount of centimorphins we share. Because there are instances where we're slightly over or under that predicted relationship amount. And, and sometimes that gets a bit tricky for people to say, like, I'm not sharing the exact amount. And this is a really nice guide to help you see what well, actually I, I am, that is my relation, that is my second cousin, I'm just on the low side of sharing because you can use this range. A guy called Johnny Pearl has just done something really cool in the last few weeks and has created uh, what he's called a DNA painter. 
And if you go to a website called dnapainter.com, he's, he's sort of made this interactive. You can type in how much CM you share with someone, and it will highlight which of these relationships it might be. So instead of doing all that manually on spreadsheets, you can just go to his site, type it in, and it will give you a prediction of where this relationship might sit. This is on the ISOL wiki. Okay. So all the charts are on this page here, autosomal DNA statistics. Uh, it's one nice page, it's got that first chart at the top, um, the, the two charts I showed before, and then this, this chart at the bottom. Someone got that down? Take a photo of it if you <coughs> So what can I do with all these matches? We've talked about getting these matches and some of the puzzles that I've been solving, so we can find new biological family, and I haven't really talked about it, but adoptees and foundlings are really jumping into DNA now because they're realising they can use other people's research to work out who their biological family are. They, of course, don't have their own tree, but with their matches, they can start looking at their matches and researching um, their trees to try and find out where their relation, their actual biological family sits. So it's been a, it's been a huge tool for, for adoptees and families. Of course, you can contact your new found cousins. Most of the sites have a, have a way for you to contact them, um, usually by email or, or, or a messaging system on the site. And you never know which of your cousins may have that family. You know, this, this bloke here, he may have a family Bible in his drawer somewhere at home that you've never seen, and it may have some of your family in it. And it may, in fact, have that one piece of the puzzle that you've been looking for. And if I find a cousin who's got, who knows exactly who my Thomas Robertson is, I'm going to be very excited. You can confirm your own traditional paper trail. So, that's a really good part of DNA. Some people say, oh, it's just confirmed what I already know. But isn't that good? You, you know, you've got another backup, another, another confirmation that you're on the right track with your paper trail. And where you're seeing families that have, got, have been independently researching and have that same family, you know, it's some comfort. You've been on the right route. You know, you, you have got your right family in your, in your family tree. And of course, you can, you can break down these genealogical brick walls, and, and especially illegitimacy. As I, as I said, you know, my great grandmother, we had no clue. There was no way paper was ever going to tell us who her father was. But when you start to have DNA matches to her stepfather's family, it's quite obvious he, you know, he, he was her father. DNA testing doesn't replace traditional genealogy, not at all. It, you, know, you don't go and do a DNA test and suddenly you don't have to do any re genealogical research. In fact, you have to almost do more genealogical research now. So it complements everything you've done um, and it sits nicely alongside all the genealogy work we've been doing for years. How am I going for time? Um, okay, cool. So matches, this is what it looks like. This is the family tree DNA site. Um, your matches, as I said, are listed in, in order, usually highest match first. So this is my mum, my sister, oh sorry, my mum, my son, uh, my sister, and then I have a whole lot of uncles. I've, I've tested five uncles and all my uncles sit under here. Um, and again, as I said, you know, it tells me how, you know, we talked before, parent-child matches about 3,500 <coughs> organs, and there's I'm matching my mum and my son. 3,334, so I know she's my mum and I know my son is my son. And then a bit further down my list, this is my second cousin once removed, I didn't know her, she lives in Australia, um, but when I look at on, on the page and I go across here and I can see she's listed in her ancestral surnames and one of those is Croker, and my lovely grandmother that's an EastEnder with Cockney, Dorothy that you met before. Um, that's Dorothy's family, she was a croaker. So I can immediately start to uh, call this lady, talk to her, and work out where in the croaker line she fits. Uh, and we've confirmed that she's my second cousin once removed. And then as I work through my list, and there's little icons in here that will help you to, to, to do different things with your match or work your match. I, my stick's not good enough. Um, so, first of all, it will show um, paternal-maternal. That is if you've tested a parent or if you've put someone, you've got 
uh, someone on your tree, you've connected up their DNA, and you've been able to show um, the system which side that is. It will then look at your other matches and mark them as maternal, paternal. So uh, maternal is kind of this pink red colour and paternal is blue. Because I had my mum tested and in here, it's, it's marked them all out for me so I can see which matches come from my mum's side. Then you've got um, an email address, so you can click that button and it will immediately tell you uh, the email address and set up the email so you can email that cousin and start to work with them. Sometimes I use that email address to do some Google searches and see if I can figure out who the person is, get a little bit of insight before I message them and I start to learn who that person is. And quite often I'll find if they don't have a family tree here, by Googling their email address, I may find their website that has their family tree on it. Uh, and then further along, there's a place where you can write in notes for your matches so you can manage them all from this page and then highlight it in blue if they actually have a family tree on this site. Now, the other thing is, will I match with all my cousins? Well, no, I won't actually. And, and sometimes people get worried, they're like, my, my fourth cousin's tested and I'm not matching to her and has the postman been involved? You know, and start to get a bit worried. But down to second cousins, so far we've not found anybody that, doesn't, that their second cousin doesn't match them. If, the second, if a second cousin has tested at the same site and doesn't match you, there is a mystery to be solved. So at the, at the moment we believe that all second cousins should match DNA with you. When we get further down, it starts to drop off. So about 10% of your third cousins won't share DNA with you. And if you think back to my grandparents, where you met them on that slide, you can see that, that as the DNA comes down the, comes down the family, it gets what we call diluted, and it, and it, and it changes, and, and some of those grandparents' DNA will drop out of the amount that gets passed down to you. So when we get down to fourth cousins, we're only going to, we could match maybe only about 50% of our fourth cousins, and then when we get to fifth cousins, we're only going to match about 10% of our fifth cousins that they test. So for me, the important part of using your DNA test, it's about identifying and verifying these matches, because that's what helps you solve these puzzles, confirm your family tree, find your bi biological family. Now, you can identify them on the site. Often they'll have a, a profile name or their own name or an email address. So you can start to identify who they are. You can open up the profile, check out anything they've got attached. That will give you some clues. Of course, you can contact them. We must remember, though, this is really, really important, that everyone who takes a DNA test has the right to privacy. Okay, so ultimately someone taking, if, if you really don't want to be identified, you probably shouldn't take a DNA test. But ultimately you shouldn't, you shouldn't stalk your, your, your matches. If they don't want to communicate to you, don't bombard them with a whole lot of emails and tell them that you know, they're not very nice cousin because they're not writing back to you. Everybody has the right to their own privacy. They have not signed up to communicate with you and work with you. They may not be genealogists. They may not be interested. So, so please always remember that. But in saying that, there's a lot of things you can do on your own. You know, you can start looking at these profiles, Google their email address, do they have a family tree on another site? And one of the big things that's becoming really easy now is because we're getting more and more people in the databases, have a look at who is in common with this person. Um, at FTDNA, we call this in common with ICW. And you can find out who else matches that, that DNA match as well. And that will give you some good clues. And you may find you've already solved who that other match is that they're in common with. So you know this person is sitting on the same branch. We may find one of the shared matches has a family tree. So you can start to pull this together and work out and identify who that match is. Um, and, and because we're getting more and more people in the database, we're getting more and more shared matches with other people. And the road to success, this is, this is what I've found has been my, what has really helped me. I first spend time researching, identifying and verifying your matches. You know, this does take time, I know that. We're, all, we're genealogists, we know it takes time to research. And DNA matching is, is no different, you do have to take some time. 
learn about, I haven't talked anything about advanced matching today, so I've not talked about chromosome browsers and I've not talked about triangulation or third party tools. Go away and learn about those when you're comfortable, when, when, you, when you want to learn more. Um, there's a lot more out there to help you with your matching. One thing too, surnames can be less important than locations. So, quite, you know, if, if you're, if you're um, matched with somebody and you share an ancestor, those ancestors have had to be at the same place at the same time to make a baby, right? So sometimes looking at the locations of where your matches ancestors come from will lead you to which side of the family you're looking for, especially if they come from a, a small village and you're like, aha, that's where my family come from as well. So sometimes locations, especially uh, with, uh, with women who you sometimes only see in documentation with their married name, um, so, so you haven't got a surname to go on anyway. Looking at where people come from can, can often be a lot, a lot more of a clue than the surname. <coughs> you can upload to other sites. Are you in all the databases? If you're looking for biological family, we always recommend you're in all the databases. Look at your shared matches. So, so I think they're a really valuable clue. Test more relatives. You know, test, test your oldest relatives now. You know, um, it, it, it really is worth doing that. Are you going to find out a lot more about their branch? You're going to go back that one generation with them as well, but you're preserving and investing their DNA for the future. And I think just quickly some of my success stories, and I've talked about these as I've gone along, so I've been able to confirm, well, it's actually my great-grandmother's father, who was a legitimate, found out my great, I actually found out my great-great-grandfather, grandmother from Lincolnshire, whose name was Elizabeth Smith. I was not spending all my time trying to sort out which Elizabeth Smith she was. Found a DNA match to a Diana Smith, and I was like, some, I, I presume the other person had their tree wrong. When I started to investigate and find all the documents and the census, I realised there were two girls, Elizabeth and Diana, both baptised on the same day. And all the documents I found, they were exactly the same age. And interestingly, this great-great-grandmother married and went out to New Zealand and ended up, she actually had twins herself. That was really cool. I, I thought that was really interesting. Some of my settlers went to Newfoundland, some of my ancestors went to Newfoundland and I found them there. I found a fourth cousin in Alaska, which I thought was really cool. Um, and, and some in Texas, all over the world. So lots, I've got lots more mysteries to find and uncover. And finally, because I think I'm getting to the end, where can you get more help? Um, so the first one is the ISOG wiki and I've already showed you some um, charts of that. There's so many things up there. Um, you, you could spend hours looking through that site. It's, it's brilliant. This is my Facebook group. So um, I'm an admin in this group with another guy. And, and we help everybody who comes into this group with questions. We get all sorts of questions. And we try and answer them all personally. YouTube videos. In fact, the first thing that started me learning about um, DNA, ultrasonal DNA, it's one of Morris's videos on YouTube, but we will be putting videos up on Genetic Genealogy Island and encourage you to watch videos. You can start and stop them, right? If you don't understand something, go back and watch it again. Write it down in a notebook or keep, or keep watching. Um, the, the videos, I think, are a brilliant learning tool. But don't forget about where you've tested as well. So the test companies all have their own help. They have webinars, they have videos, they have blogs, they have all sorts of links on their site to help and guide you as well. And I think, Morris, that's the end. Thank you, Donna Rutherford. <laughs> what, a, what a whirlwind tour. <laughs> great, great presentation. Now, how many people... See, my microphone is probably going to go again. And I'm going to try speaking like this, okay. So, hopefully, I don't know if I have to stand to make it heard. Ah, maybe that's a little bit better now. Uh, how many people have done autosomal DNA testing? Right, okay, so um, it's, you were speaking to the converters to an extent. Any questions for Donna? You had a question over here, don't you? Um, I have been able to trace one line lineage from my family back to her great-grandparents, but uh, I have no idea who their parents were or anything about siblings. And we're talking, I guess, about kind of uh, match up with fifth cousins. There are probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds out there, and most don't know anything. How do you do that research? It is really difficult when you start to get to fifth cousins, and 
as, as I said, not all of your fit cousins go to match you anyway. So uh, once it starts to get that to level, the, the amount of information they get from all the sonal DNA test is going to drop off. But if, if you can at least find one, then start to look at the shared matches, and you can start to build up the other people that are matching the one that you have found. Um, it, it's just research. Oh, I talked a lot of time about fourth cousins and closer, because typically that's where I spend my research time. Um, even because A, it's easier. The other thing is if you can test someone in that uh, one generation above you, if that's possible, whether it be a parent or a sibling of a parent or somebody else, it might help you to lead, to lead you to the or, or even if you've got a cousin who comes up that line and they still have someone who's available for testing, you could try and, try and find someone. I thought this is just flowering through trees, building trees, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about the interference on the um, loudspeaker. It's actually coming through from the other uh, session. I'll have to check. And as far as I can tell from the paper trail, I'm the third cousin of three of his mm -hmm. grandparents. And is there anyone working on how to disentangle this sort of stuff, where you've got lots of cousin marriages? Uh, <laughs> The, the worst situation people have is if they're in something like Ashkenazi Jew, where they, their entire genealogy is, is endogamous. Everybody is interbred. And it's really difficult for them because every single match looks like, every, every single match they get, it's their second cousin. And it could be a sixth or seventh cousin. There's no easy way to do that at the moment. No one's been able to disentangle that. The, per, the person who can work out how to deal with an endogamous matches is, I think, going to be uh, a very <coughs> very important person. <laughs> um, for, for me, I've been able to work out with what I've found so far that my first anyone on my first cousin branch look about a generation closer to me. So if I see second or third cousins come in on that line, I know they're probably, I'm probably looking at fourth cousins. Um, so, so I've just tried to work out. And if, if it's just one line, I think, I think from what I've found, it's about one, one, gen one generation closer than they really are. We have one final question here from Dick Doherty. Now, do you uh, explain how siblings can have different DNA relationships? Uh, so, as you went back and you've got the one ancestor, the stepfather, and you said, it turns out he is the father, how did you determine what tools to use to determine it wasn't one of his siblings? It was, it was one of his siblings, because I, I had built out his tree as well at one point, only a little bit. But when I started to find the matches and started building their tree back to meet mine, I then went one step behind him to his father, and that's where those matches were going up to. And it was about building the trees. And when I realised that these matches sat on it, he was a pepper. When I realised that those matches sat on the pepper tree, was when I re and I looked at their trees to make sure I didn't match them in any other way. And there was a whole lot of them who all tested four or five cousins, and, and they all matched back to Samuel Pepper's father's line. So most of the stepfather's brother's descendants. All about tree building. Fabulous. Well. Um, I think that's all that we have time for in terms of uh, questions and answers. I'll have to fix the uh, technical problems, but um, hopefully it hasn't spoiled your enjoyment of Donna Rutherford's fabulous presentation. Thank you. Thank you.